About a year ago or so, I made a video titled Response to Metatrons, Where the Ancient Egyptians Black, The Truth exposing the bias. And the video did unexpectedly well over the year, especially for a small channel like mine, thanks to the people who viewed and shared that video. Making that response, I never thought that Metatron would actually give it any attention. But I guess miracles do exist because lo and behold, Metatron actually saw the video and said to make a response video where he supposedly, according to his followers, destroyed me, my arguments, and my entire channel, along with all the studies and scholars whose work I reference to defend my position, claiming that my sources are quote Afrocentric and according to his followers who have for the past few weeks spammed my response video to Metatron's video with comments berating me and claiming that my whole channel is a joke and got owned. Well, did it though. If my video was so weak, why did the far more successful YouTuber Metatron thought it deserved a response? And a better question is, why did he feel the need to gather two other linguists and an Egyptologist to respond to said weak arguments? Just an entry thought for those who made those comments in my comment section. Anyhow, let's see if his new response has some new arguments to support his position. Let's see if his response video really destroyed or even addressed the surface level counter arguments I put in that initial response. Yes, that's right. That video was surface level. Those who follow my channel will know that I can go deeper. And in this video, deeper we shall go. So without further ado, Kolemika's response to Metatron's response to Kolemika. <laughs> Brace for impact. Oh my god! <laughs> Lord. So, in order to respond to the video in a fair manner, because I believe in fair debates, I will play the part with which I have an issue, just as I did in my initial response, and respond to it and present the reasons for why I agree or disagree. In this video, as I said earlier, I will go deeper with the arguments I make and the evidence I will present to support my position, and why I don't think Metatron's view is supported by what we currently know about the history of the Nile Valley civilizations. Enough introduction, let's get into the topic. Quelimiga, a channel entirely dedicated to Afrocentricity, responded with a debunking video. So already, as the video starts, Metatron does something that I think is quite damaging to the debate, and that is stating that my channel is devoted to Afrocentricity, implanting in the audience that my whole channel is biased and will not present any arguments based on factual evidence. Saying this even before presenting any arguments I make to the audience is like me describing Metatron and his whole channel as a right-wing pandering history channel before I even said to go against his arguments. It's clearly wrong and it concerns in no way the argument I brought up against his point. And that's not to say that I think Metatron is a right-wing pandering YouTube channel. I just gave it as an example. And that is the recurring issue we will find in this video, not addressing the arguments but rather referring to the person who brings them as Afrocentric. With Without even looking into the source. This is why I avoid on my channel terms such as Afrocentrist or Eurocentrist. Those are a dominant attacks which I avoid on my channel. I prefer to look at the argument the person makes regardless of political beliefs, race, religion, or ethnicity. Furthermore, I never claimed anywhere that I am devoted to Afrocentricity, but it is Metatron's opinion that the content of my channel qualifies as such, so it's his opinion, nothing factual. Metatron will say it is because I made the distinction between Afrocentricity and Afrocentrism on my channel, that it points to the fact that I am a devotee of the movement. That's funny. It's like calling someone who makes the distinction between socialism and communism a devotee communist or socialist. But Metatron knows why he did this. By calling my channel Afrocentrist, he already introduces a huge bias against me and my arguments in the debate. And that's a fact. Why? Because to the people outside the Afrocentric community, which I've not claimed I'm part of, Afrocentrists are viewed as biased people who refuse to face historical facts and rather create a historical fantasy. To some, Afrocentrists are even viewed as racist black supremacists. So to many, they won't even bother to listen to what I have to say because of that label, because it comes with certain characteristics. And so people will make judgments about me, which I have seen has already happened in the comment section of the video responding to Metatron's initial video, but I won't hold this against you. Maybe you didn't do it on purpose. But Metatron also likes to define logical fallacies, so it could be that he knew exactly what he was doing by using the term in the very title of his video and in the video itself. There are several factors that influence whether I decide to enter a debate publicly or not. Now he qualified because he brings forward some decent points, he's clearly educated, and he doesn't call me a racist, so Wilmika, I commend you for that. <laughs> 
Why does Metatron assume that I would call him a racist? It seems Metatron has some assumptions about me, which really links to my point about Afrocentricity. Anyway, I don't use name calling in a debate. It's a logical fallacy. I could have done so in the initial response I made to your video, but I didn't because I don't use name calling. Also, I only call someone a racist when they are overtly racist and make racist arguments like blacks are too unsophisticated or backwards to build a complex civilization, an argument I see often under my videos. But I don't think that you hold this position, obviously. And you would agree that it is indeed a racist position, right? Anyhow, you said I qualify because I brought forth some decent points and that I am clearly educated. Oh, okay. Since I'm clearly educated, I am very curious to know what you think these good points are. With that being said, he does accuse me of this. We're going to expose the lack of rigor and intellectual integrity in the research of the Metatron's video on ancient Egypt to stop misleading people and do more research, please. I doubt that he did proper research for his video. Jokes on you, man. Jokes on you, Metatron. <laughs> Which I don't take lightly. Um, I still stand by that statement. It was not a personal attack against you, Metatron. I just thought that in that initial video, you misrepresented the debate on the question. And so I made that claim. It was not your integrity in every video you made that was questioned. It was your integrity in that specific video that was questioned on that specific subject. Don't take this so personally, Metatron. I did not question your integrity about, say, your knowledge about medieval armor and your honest opinion on it. I questioned your integrity about this specific subject. I honestly think you misrepresented the scholarly debate behind this issue. With you being a linguist scholar and all, with a team behind you, you should be aware of the scholarly debate that surrounds this issue. Not just be aware of some Twitter opinion, but the scholarly opinions on both sides of the arguments, which you presented none for the opposing side of the arguments in your video, especially since the very field you are part of, linguistics, is very implicated in that debate. This is the standard I I hold you too as a scholar, Metatron. You are not a random dude on YouTube. You are Metatron the linguist scholar. We have standards for people like you who claim you're scholars, and that is rigor in your presentation of a contentious issue. Something I tried my best to do in this video you can find on my channel, where I presented the scholarly opinion of scholars whose opinions I disagree with. Scholars, not random Twitter accounts. See people, I could have easily taken a tweet from some Twitter account making a racist argument against the black African origin to Egypt as well, and make the whole other side look irrational and racist, but I don't, because it would be a non-debate and very biased at that and easy to win. So I still stand by my initial statement, the video was not properly researched. It's almost like you didn't want your audience to be exposed to the arguments and fair points of the opposite side, but that's just speculation isn't it? Maybe you didn't care to look deeper, or maybe you didn't have time to look deeper. We don't know. You just claim, according to my research, that you don't even reference or link. So you leave us guessing, and so I made those claims. I didn't just watch his video response, I watched and analyzed every single video on his entire channel with my full team. Every single video? Okay, well let's see if the points made in all those videos will be properly addressed here. It's about 18 hours of content, so 35 minutes to address everything? That smells fair representation of the opponent's viewpoint. Including two linguists, one archaeologist, one Egyptologist, a published historian, and anthropologist PhD. Okay, hi doctors, nice to make your acquaintances. Consider subscribing if you would like to further see what I bring forth. Okay, just teasing as always. Let's be serious. Metatron gathered a nice team here, and I commend that. I didn't think that my video would have such an impact. I've also identified several rhetorical devices that he uses on his video response to me in order to be more persuasive. These do not constitute honest discourse. Hence, every time he uses one, I will point it out and call it out. Now, here is another issue with this video response. We spent more time calling out these so-called rhetorical devices instead of focusing on the arguments. You will notice this as the video goes on. Within his audience, he has people who are interested in historical truths, I have no quarrel with them whatsoever, but he also has people who are in utter rebellion against external factual reality and have attacked me personally, mostly based on me having white skin, as evidenced by the comments section of my original video. So Metatron says that he received racist comments under his video. I vehemently condemn that behavior. However, I also received a ton of racist comments, some outright calling me a monkey or too unintelligent to be part of the complex and developed civilization of ancient Egypt, and this due to my black African heritage and also due to my skin color. 
And these people are also in your comment section praising you Metatron for your initial video. Though I am not saying that everyone in your comment section is like this, but those French people are always there. It's the internet. So this behavior is on both sides and can clearly not be blamed on the creators of videos. So please point it on both sides, not just one. Let's attack arguments only and boy, am I in full assault mode today. Okay. So these are the points Metatron is going to quote unquote assault today. Though I was ready for the quote assault yesterday, the ammunition was already in store, as you shall see. My point, ancient Egypt was a multicultural and multi-ethnic civilization due to its geolocation connecting the Middle East, Africa, Asia and Europe, a strategic location on the crossroad of continents, flourishing around the Nile River, which was a cultural conduit of civilization. Therefore, there is diversity on the skin of the Egyptians. Throughout time and location, the ethnic percentages will vary depending on era and region. According to the results of my research, the majority of ancient Egyptians would have had an olive skin, with a lower percentage of black individuals living mostly in the southern areas of Egypt, and some white settlers and white ruling elite during the later periods. The ancient Egyptians were a multi-ethnic African civilization, and their ethnicity was inextricable tied to the geographic location. So, you have heard Metatron's point in his own words, something I did not get the courtesy of in his video. Anyhow, I said in my original response video, I don't disagree that other ethnicities were present in ancient Egypt. I even said in my original response video that non-African ethnicities were definitely present in the Nile Valley, but Metatron omitted that of course, because little of my video was actually played in his response. Why? My guess is that he wanted it to look like an intellectual spanking, to make it look like he was my intellectual superior. Hmm. My point of contention on the point Metatron just made was in how he ignores the foundational period of the civilization in his multi-ethnic conclusion. You have to wonder why Metatron would not look into the foundational history of ancient Egypt as we shall soon do. But first, let's see how he summarizes my viewpoint. Your point. Ancient Egypt was originally founded by one indigenous black African culture, namely the Nakta culture from down South Africa, and the other Eurasian ethnic groups joined in later and constituted a minority. You in fact make fun of the Egypt was a multi-ethnic society argument, so to you, the ancient Egyptians were predominantly black. Hmm. Did you hear my voice there? Anyhow, let's actually play what I said in my initial response. Ah, uh, the old Egypt is a multi-ethnic society argument. No serious scholar is denying the presence of other ethnicities in Egypt. Instead, they argue that Egypt was a product of the indigenous black African populations that lived in the Nile Valley, coming from further south. And those southern areas of the Nile Valley were undeniably inhabited by black Africans. This thesis is supported by studies showing that ancient Egypt was developed indigenously. Also, linguistic evidence, ancient testimonies from Greek scholars, and the archaeological documents from the Nakta culture, who are believed to have been at the origin of the dynastic Egypt, that is the Egypt of the pharaohs, all support the idea that Kemet, that is ancient Egypt, was originated by one indigenous black African culture, and that the other Eurasian ethnic groups joined in later either by immigration or conquest since some of them were already settled in the Delta. What we know is that that dynastic Egypt originated in Upper Egypt, that is, the south of Egypt. It's a bit like the USA today. It is a multi-ethnic society, but we all know that their culture and country were originated by European Englishmen, and not by all the ethnicities that live there today. So that's the same case for ancient Egypt. Although there were multiple ethnicities living there, that doesn't mean that they all were at the origin of the same civilization. What we argue is that the culture known as ancient Egypt was originated by the people of the Naka culture who were black. They came from Upper Egypt and Lower Nubia. The evidence is there to support this. Did you notice the nuance? So Metatron could have easily played this part to present my viewpoint to his audience, but he preferred to narrate it himself. You heard it. I said that I don't disagree that other ethnicities were present in ancient Egypt. That is what I was mocking. I never mocked the fact that various ethnicities were present in ancient Egypt. I mocked the fact that you thought serious scholars who claimed ancient Egypt was originated by black Africans thought that other ethnicities were non-existent in ancient Egypt. My point of contention, again, was that the multi-ethnic argument argument makes it sound like all ethnicities that were there at some point contributed equally to the foundation of the civilization. That's simply not the case. By this logic, Metatron should have no problem calling ancient Rome a multi-ethnic civilization, since it was present in Africa and Asia too, and that many people of different ethnicities were part of the Great Roman Empire. But were they equal to the people from Southern Europe who founded the civilization? No. But you hardly ever hear anyone calling Rome multi-ethnic, even if other ethnicities were there. It is always spoken of as a white European civilization. 
and you never see anyone attributing the creation and development of the Roman civilization to anyone other than the southern Europeans who created that civilization, despite the fact that many other non-Europeans were there in that civilization. So Rome should be classified as another multi-ethnic civilization, and no one in particular should claim it, or at least Africa, Asia, and Europe together should claim the creation and development of the Roman civilization. But we all know this does not stand, because the ones who built the foundational elements that made that civilization what it was, and were the primary group to have unified the other ethnicities under their empire, was a southern European ethnic group. And Metatron, you make videos where you are not okay with Europeans trying to over-highlight the multi-ethnic side of ancient Rome. In those analyses, you look at the foundational population to back your argument, but for ancient Egypt, you don't do so. But I am not one to ignore that. So here is what the scholarly evidence tells us about the foundational history of ancient Egypt. When we look at the people that founded the civilization known as Kemet by the ancient Egyptians, scholars believe that the culture that gave us pharaonic Egypt is the Nakata culture, and here is why. The Nakata culture is the culture where the ancient Egyptians first wrote in hieroglyphs, a very important aspect of their civilization. Wouldn't you agree? This is the culture where the pharaonic rule was adopted in ancient Egypt. This is also where the prominent symbols of kingship were adopted, that is, the white crown, the falcon deity, the mace, and the flail, etc. This is the culture where their government style originates as well. This is also the culture from which their first kings originate from. Here is what the Oxford History of Ancient Egypt has to say about this topic. It was during this period, the Nakata III period, that Egypt was first unified into a large territorial state, and the political consolidation that laid the foundations for the early dynastic state of the first and second dynasties must also have occurred then. As you heard the Afrocentric Oxford Encyclopedia, the Nakata culture in the Nakata period is when Egypt was first unified into a dynastic state. And this culture was concentrated in the south, and that is actually where they originated, according to archaeological data on the culture. Of course, they spread north as well, but their concentration was in the south, as you can see on this map of archaeological Nakata sites. The very region Metatron seems to look down upon is where the civilization originated, that is, the south, not the delta, where the so-called minority of black individuals lived according to Metatron. And this is the culture that gave us the first rulers and armies of ancient Egypt. As for their religion and architecture, they also originated in the south, not the delta. The first pharaoh was from the south, not the delta. Now, that's all well and good, but what did these people look like? According to anthropometrics and archaeology and DNA, the people of the Nakata culture were akin to black Africans. Here is a study by Tracy L. Prowsey and Nancy C. Lovell linking the Nakata populations to Nubians. A comparison with neighboring Nile Valley skeletal samples suggests that the high status symmetry represents an endogamous ruling or elite segment of the local population at Nakada, which is more closely related to populations in northern Nubia than to neighboring populations in southern Egypt. They believe the ruling elite was endogamous, meaning indigenous, and they came from the south in Lower Nubia, that is northern Sudan. To further support the endogamous creation of ancient Egypt, a later 2007 study conducted by scholar Sonia R. Zakrzewski said the following. The results indicate overall population continuity of the pre-dynastic and early dynastic and high levels of genetic heterogeneity, thereby suggesting that state formation occurred as a mainly indigenous process. Nevertheless, significant differences were found in morphology between both geographically pulled and cemetery-specific temporal groups, indicating that some migration occurred along the Egyptian Nile Valley over the period studied. Another Afrocentric source cited many times on my channel, according to Metatron. These are the studies Metatron does not want you to know about, because they deal with the foundational period of the state, and look into whether the civilization is the product of Asian, African, and European people coming together. But no, it wasn't. It was a purely African product. The civilization was the product of indigenous African people, of whom many were black. Another population that was present among the Nakada peoples were the people of Adaima, a people whose archaeological remains inform us that they were present during the pre-dynastic period and in the early dynastic period. And with these remains, we not only have anthropometric data, but also DNA. And here is what they say on the Adaima people. In 2010, the research group Archaeoneal, a French research group, published the results of their 20 years long research on the pre-dynastic populations. And here is what they found about the DNA of the Adaima population. 
Haplogroup L0F, present at 3% among Muslims, is currently common in South Africa among Khoisan and almost absent elsewhere. Its presence in Adaima is intriguing because the slave trade did not date back that far. In this case, one can wonder if we would not have there the vestige of a proto-Khoisan population partly at the origin of pre-dynastic populations. Here is what they go on to say about their anthropometric dental traits analysis. One of the particularities of the Adaima population highlighted during the preliminary study is the high frequency of upper canine skulled bushmen, which present an anatomical variation very frequent in certain African populations, especially the Khoisan. The African origin of the population, already widely suspected, is here confirmed. Those elements confirmed the African origin of these people. These are not studies you will see the mainstream talk about. The Nakata culture did not originate elsewhere other than the African continent. And the studies we have on them so far suggest that they are black Africans. These were the originators of the civilization and they were from the south. This is most likely why the ancient Egyptians regarded towards the south and called that region upper and called the delta region lower because their first kings were from the upper region that is the south and every major period of their kingdom that is the old, the middle and new kingdoms were spurred from the south as the data on the history illustrates. Even their mythology states that their gods were from the southern region. In the Book of the Dead, it is said that the main god, the one and only god, passes first by Nubia, then comes to Egypt. So again, evidence pointing to the southern origin of these gods. This is significant because cultures tend to want to come from where their gods come from, the same gods which they viewed as their literal direct ancestors. The land of the gods, aka Punt, was further south as the majority of scholars agree. And in their mythology, history, and royal royal titles, the south of ancient Egypt, the upper region, held precedence over the northern part of ancient Egypt, the lower region. This is because the first king to have unified the two lands under one rule came from the south. You can even see this in their expressions related to royalty, which I explained in this video. Please take a listen. This is pronounced Nizut. This is the original title of the pharaohs. The term pharaoh in ancient Kemetic Per'a or Per was only used in the later periods of Kemet. The original title was Nesut, which means the one who belongs to Upper Kemet, the king in the south. Then after the conquest of the two lands, the title of the king became Nesut Pechet, meaning king of Upper and Lower Kemet. But the term Nesut was still often used on its own even later on. This shows you the precedence Upper Kemet had over Lower Kemet, and it makes sense because the founding father of Kemet was from Upper Kemet. This is Namer, the king in the south. Did you see it? This is why looking at the foundational period is important. It gives us an insight on whether the civilization was really the creation of multiple ethnicities or that other ethnicities just happened to be there when the nation was founded by a specific group in the area. My position is that black Africans founded and unified the two lands. They were the creators of the foundational elements that made ancient Egypt the civilization it was. That is, their writing system, architecture, religion, mummification techniques, etc. were all originated on the continent by black Africans in the southern region of the civilization. And these black Africans were heavily present in the civilization from its foundation until its decline as suggests their iconography. And of course, the Asians were there even from the foundational period, but they were just not the founders nor the creators of the elements that made the civilization or the nation what it was, as the multi-ethnic argument implicitly suggests. Because when you hear multi-ethnic, you think, oh, the Africans brought the religion, Asians the writing, and Europeans the architecture. But that's simply not the case, as the evidence suggests. That is my position and the position of the scholars who defend the hypothesis of the black African origin of ancient Egypt. All these are the points I have already made on my channel months ago, with sources to back up my claims in the description box. The same channel that Metatron claims to have thoroughly watched but he somehow missed these points and the sources provided. Did they actually watch everything thoroughly? If yes, then we understand that they did not want to show these to their audience, which would make them dishonest, at the very least, for attempting to make my arguments look unsupported. If not, then we understand why they missed this, and that would make Metatron a liar for making such a claim in his video. So which is it? And also, the ancient Egyptians were mostly olive-skinned? That claim came back again. Well, we will address this when we reach the painting's argument, because that's where he draws his conclusion from, or has he said himself his interpretation. Anyhow, let's carry on. So, bias being the keyword here. Are you sure you want to use that one, Polimika? 
Now let me show the viewer why you're standing on very weak ground with this accusation of bias. Clearly our audiences cannot read our minds, so how can they determine who is the biased one here? Well, let's discuss the consequences of admitting fault when it comes to the research of our videos. When it comes to my channel, I cover a wide range of topics, ancient Egypt being a very marginal one. If evidence is presented to counter my arguments, it would not hurt my channel nor my public image one bit if I had to admit fault due to new overwhelming evidence. I know that because I have admitted fault in the past. You, on the other hand, have an entire channel based on ancient Egypt being black. So during this debate, if you admit you were wrong, your entire channel will cease to exist. Differently from me, you have a lot at stake here. So given the stakes, who is more likely to be intellectually dishonest here? Me or you? Just as a matter of deductive logic. Bias. I accused Metatron of being biased in his original video. Why did I make such an accusation? I made the accusation because he misrepresented one side of the argument. That is, the black African origin of ancient Egypt hypothesis and that they made up the majority of the population. I said that because Metatron failed to present the academic points for this hypothesis and thus I surmised that it was either lack of knowledge that there is even such a thing as scholars who think that ancient Egypt should be considered as a black African civilization created on African soil by a population who was predominantly black African which would suggest a lack of research on that side at least, hence the accusation of lack of rigor in the research, since he came at it knowing that the question was heavily debated. Therefore, only bringing the scholarly and strong arguments from one side suggests that you either didn't know or want to look for the scholarly arguments on the other side or even simply cared to do so, or that you had a bias against the other side thinking they were too political or something, and that there couldn't be any scientific or logical arguments behind them. Those were my guesses, given that you are a scholar yourself and a linguist at that, you could have at least been aware of the debate about the origin of the Afro-Asiatic language family in your field, a debate which is inseparable from the ancient Egyptian race debate. So what should we think, Metatron, if you didn't know of the scholarly arguments for a black African Egypt hypothesis, then I call that lack of rigor in the research. And if you knew about them but chose not to show them to your audience, then I call it bias and dishonesty. So which is it? Because when I did my two parts videos on the history of the debate, I used scholarly arguments from both sides, not just tweets or forum comments, but actual Egyptologists and other scholars, so that they don't accuse me of a bias in the representation of the other side. Also, Metatron seems to want to implant the idea that because I make a lot of videos on this topic, I cannot present facts, evidence and unbiased arguments on this topic. It's like saying, this YouTuber makes too many videos on medieval armor, he can't possibly give a logical argument and bring forth evidence in a debate about medieval armors. Come on, the one does not necessarily go with the others. Someone can be biased in an argument and still make decent points and facts that needs to be addressed. It doesn't really matter whether someone is biased or not, we still have to look at their arguments and pit them against facts. So let's focus on the arguments, shall we? And also, Metatron, I do change my mind. If one can honestly address all the points made there with good counter-arguments supported by strong evidence, I will have no choice but to change my mind. And I'm not preaching dogma here. There is no conflict of interest here. Address all the arguments with counter-evidence and I will happily change my mind. Don't accuse me of being biased because I make a lot of videos on this topic. You actually still have to address my points which you still haven't done five minutes into the video. On top of that, if one were to look at your channel banner, well, you did go out of your way to take the entirety of planet Earth and turn it around just so you could put Africa on top of Europe. That doesn't exactly fill me with confidence when it comes to your supposed lack of bias. Bruh. <laughs> Metatron, come on. I did it as a reference point to the fact that the ancestors in the Nile Valley, be it the Kushites or the Kemites, viewed the world that way. North was south, east was west to them, to the Nubians and the ancient Egyptians. But in Europe, it was the contrary, just a point of view, Metatron, nothing more. The earth is floating in empty space. What you choose to call north, others can call south. And in ancient Africa, they viewed the south as the northern region. Hence, the terms upper being the south and lower being the north. That's all that the map reverse represents. I am surprised the Egyptologist in your team did not let you know about the fact that the reverse of the map could be a reference to that fact, something they know very well in their field. And thank you for allowing me, Metatron, to clarify that for people who may not have understood the reference, like you, and thought that I was just reversing the map to put Africa on top of Europe for some supremacy. <laughs> Another attempt at making me look bad before even addressing my arguments. Metatron is basically doing this. 
Come on, folks. Are we going to listen to someone who is devoted to Afrocentricity, reverses the maps of Africa to put Africa above Europe, and uses solely Afrocentric sources? Nothing else. <laughs> Typical ad dominum attack, as described in this example. After Sally presents an eloquent and compelling case for a more equitable taxation system, Sam asks the audience whether we should believe anything from a woman who isn't married, was once arrested, and smells a bit weird. None of that has to do with her arguments at dominum attack. So as someone who cares about our history, the expression our history is a massive red flag for me. Um, uh, what's the problem with the term our history? If a European person says our history when speaking of European history, is it a problem? No, clearly. Then how is it a problem for an African to say so about the history of his continent? The history of Egypt is part of African history. It's part of the history of the continent, just as much as the history of Mali or Great Zimbabwe, however much you guys try to separate them. They are both African history. So yes, I can call it our history still, because I am an African and so is an Egyptian. I did not use it in the racist way you seem to be implying. But of course you already implanted the idea in people's mind, even if after that you claimed it was ambiguous. Us, but you already called me an Afrocentrist, and to people who think Afrocentrists are racist black supremacists with fantasy history in their head, well, this here claim on your video you did not call me racist, I'll return the favor and give you the benefit of the doubt will be what they will go with, as they already have in the comment section of my response video. This video claims to summarize a multi centenary old debate in what 18 minutes this here is already an issue. The problem alluded to by Kualimika here is that since I admitted that Egypt and its ethnicity is a complex and multi layered topic, then the fact that my video was only 18 minutes long is somehow an attack on my credibility. Having chosen this point of critique, surely if we were to look at this channel, all of his videos when dealing with complex topics will have to be extremely long, right? The African origins of humanity sounds like a pretty deep and multi-layer topic right there. Oh. Uh, that video is that long because there already is a scholarly consensus on that issue, Metatron. As the evidence currently stands, unless you have some new strong evidence against the out of Africa hypothesis, which has been genetically proven many times over, there is not much debate there. It simply is not like the debate on the race of the ancient Egyptians. Okay, could it have been longer? Sure, I'll give you that one. But this one? This is a snippet from a longer video on the subject of iconography comparison, something your team and you would know had you thoroughly watched all the videos on my channel as you claimed Metatron. You even went after the trailer of the channel, where I specifically state that I decided to make more videos on the matter. The video is an introduction to the channel's initial phase of debating and exposing the dishonesty that can be found in this debate, something I have done with hours of content exploring the debate from multiple angles. Again, you watched and analyzed every single video? Okay, but I will just say this. You do have to agree that my video did convince you to do more research on this topic and give it more time, since you even gathered a whole team of scholars this time around. Anyhow, my point was just that if you have to properly address the arguments from each side on this debate to arrive at the truth, you have to take more time. And I said in my original response that I think you are too busy for that, which is understandable. Anyhow, just don't take it personally, Metatron. It's nothing personal. As you see here, Metatron goes to find a guy on Twitter that he is claiming extreme stuff that do not at all represent the arguments for a black Egypt. This one hasn't aged well, has it? You said that me pointing out a random guy believing that Cleopatra should be black was pointless because, I mean, nobody believes that. And then this happened. Well, you clearly didn't see that one coming. I did. You ridiculed me for bringing up this whole Cleopatra was black point? Jokes on you, man. Remember, noble ones, not everything that sounds persuasive constitutes a valid point of argument. Metatron, I didn't say that it was pointless and that nobody believed that. I said, quote, as you see here, Metatron goes to find a guy on Twitter that he is claiming extreme stuff that do not at all represent the arguments for a black Egypt. As everyone just heard, I didn't say that no one believed it, and I also never said that it was pointless to point it out. I said it is an extreme belief that does not represent the scholarly position for a black Egypt. Extreme beliefs exist in every camp, and sometimes some of those extreme beliefs get to be put in the mainstream media and their more moderate scholarly counterparts get ignored in the mainstream. You make it seem again as if my position supports that docu-series, and that's just wrong. I have said publicly on many occasions that I do not support the documentary and I think it was wrong. In one of the videos your team and you supposedly watched, again, I personally bashed the team who made the documentary for choosing Cleopatra because I don't think she was a black woman. Since their goal was to make a docu-series about a powerful black queen, I thought they could have picked 
picked other queens such as Queen Amosi Nefertari or Queen Amanorinus. Or even, not just to focus on the Nile Valley, they could have also picked Queen Zinka, Queen Amina or any other queen in African history. And also, I didn't mock you on this point Metatron, come on, I even agreed with you on that point. Please, stop misusing the chuckle you included in there that was about your point on black people looking specifically like Mahershala Ali. It was never about Cleopatra. I'll count this again as another cheap attempt at making me look bad before you even go against the main issue, the arguments. A quick search on Wikipedia will help you know the scholars that have spoken for and against these hypotheses. A quick search on Wikipedia is not that hard. <sighs> Uh, anyhow. This is a subtle conversation trick. Well, it's such an easy thing to do, just look it up on Wikipedia, but you couldn't even do that. Well, first of all, it's a non-argument. I do not use Wikipedia, Quilimika. And to be honest, neither should you. At least if you want any academic value to your work. So based on your own words, it seems like we both agree that a quick search on Wikipedia isn't exactly the best thing to suggest to your intellectual opponent during a debate. The Wikipedia point. Well, I never suggested that Wikipedia was the best source and should be your only source. But here Metatron makes it seem like that is my only source, that Wikipedia is the only place I go to to do my research. My videos don't use Wikipedia as the only source. As you can see, I use various sources in my videos. These include studies, books, research articles, etc. Wikipedia is sometimes listed there for quick rundowns on topics one may not have some knowledge on, as Wikipedia is a good entry level source because it lists its references as opposed to other websites. They are there for the public. But for the academics and scholars who would like to review my research, the research papers from their peers are there. The articles and studies are also there. If you don't believe me, check the description of some of my videos. Also, this may have gone over the heads of many, but Wikipedia at least lists its references so you can fact check where their claims come from or whether they are accurate or use them as entry level research to go deeper. My point on that Wikipedia claim was that since Metatron didn't put any scholarly source in his original video from the black Egypt side of the argument, I gave him the benefit of the doubt and thought that maybe he didn't know and so I encouraged him to at least google the issue since Google brings up this Wikipedia article on the controversy on the race of the ancient Egyptians as one of their top searches if not the top search. But I guess an extreme tweet that lists no references to their claim is better for something that is closer to a scholarly opinion. Anyhow, he stated that he also visited forums. Which ones? We don't know. There is nothing sourced. So again, Metatron leaves us guessing here as he did in his original video. Was he aware that there were scholarly arguments put forth for a Black Egypt hypothesis or not? I know some forum comments will let you know about certain scholars who support these hypotheses. Did he care to let us know which forums he visited? We won't know until he chooses to inform us. In my original response, I again said that why does he fail to address the scholars like Dr. Shekhante Diop, Dr. Chancellor Williams and many others who make scholarly arguments in their books. Does he even know they exist or not? The point was never addressed. Instead, you chose to go for the low-hanging fruit of the Wikipedia suggestion. Metatron says he's a scholar but presents none of the scholarly arguments from the other side and acts like they don't exist but they do. There are so many papers contradicting his position. Anyhow, on to the next point. Is Metatron aware that the ancient Greeks unanimously called the ancient Egyptians black? Okay. <laughs> Good. Another word I knew you would not overlook and attack if you ever saw the video. It was a deliberate misuse of the term. In my original script, I wrote most, but I went and changed to unanimously because I knew you could not overlook such a claim. Anyhow, in my videos on the ancient descriptions, I am not so absolute. I use more moderate terms such as many or several or most. Most ancient Greek sources do indeed describe the ancient Egyptians as black on multiple occasions. I have two videos on the topic already, one going deeper than the other, but there is more info to take into account that many people ignore. But first, let's hear what he has to say about it. Within this rhetorical question of yours, there are several presuppositions that I believe need to be addressed. And besides, within your entire debunking video, this is in fact your weakest point. How can I put it? You are, let's be generous, catastrophically mistaken here. Allow me to elaborate. There isn't only one verse that can completely debunk this point of yours. There is a whole cluster of passages, a veritable cornucopia, which I'll report here, one by one. Furthermore, your linguistic approach within the realm of translation contains significant methodological flaws. And just like the majority of Afrocentric scholars, you omit passages that contradict your statements. Let's pause right there. So Metatron is claiming here that the quote-unquote Afrocentric scholars like me omit passages that contradict our own. I'll ignore the Afrocentric claim right there. What I will point out instead is that he never actually directly addresses the quotes I present in my videos on the ancient descriptions. What he does instead is present his own quotes and attacks only one quote that I presented in my two videos on this subject. Why omit them? You have got to be aware 
of them since you analyzed every video on my channel, remember? But instead, he proceeds to talk about the word Ethiopian and the difference of meaning it has with the modern one. And then he proceeds to read us these quotes. Pause to read the quote if you will. In this quote, Metatron presents the writings of an author from the 1st century AD, who tells us in a poem that people of ancient Egypt would have been a more medium tone compared to Ethiopians who stained the world. Okay, so what is the context here? This is an author from the 1st century AD writing a poem about astrology and its effect on humans in a period when ancient Egypt had already been conquered for over three centuries. And let's remember that when the Greek general Alexander the Great arrived in Egypt, he encouraged his soldiers to settle in Egypt and mix with the local population, as this source confirms. That is the historical context. First century AD, long time after the Greeks had come, three centuries, enough to change the tone of the population through mixing, and after that the Romans came, and enough again mixing to change the tone of the population. That's the historical context here. Compare his quotes to these quotes from Herodotus and Diodorus, who had both traveled to the Nile Valley, and both gave a physical description of the people they saw in the Nile Valley, so they both traveled to Egypt basically. One does so in 430 BC, that is Herodotus, and the other in the 1st century BC, that is Diodorus. That is the context of their description. Here are the quotes I presented that deal specifically with the physical description of the population in ancient Egypt. Don't worry, it will be quick. Herodotus says in the Histories Book 2, Section 22, The people dwelling there along the Nile are black because of the heat, and Diodorus said this about the people he saw. But there are also a great many other tribes of the Ethiopians, some of them dwelling in the land lying on both banks of the Nile and on the islands in the river, others inhabiting the neighboring country of Arabia, and still others residing in the interior of Libya. The majority of them, and especially those who dwell along the river, are black in color and have flat noses and woolly hair. Why do these quotes matter and why am I showing the original Greek text? The quotes matter because both Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus give us a physical description of the people they saw along the Nile. Herodotus describes the general population that lives along the Nile and this includes the ancient Egyptians in his description because, you know, they dwelled along the Nile. While Diodorus focuses on the Ethiopians, that is the Nubians. But here is the interesting thing. While one of them is describing a people whose race is debated, the other Diodorus Siculus describes a people we can all agree here were black. They have flat noses, woolly hair, and black skin. Now here is why I juxtaposed the original text with the translations. These two authors used in their original ancient Greek text the same term to describe the skin color of the people who dwell around the Nile. Given that Herodotus, who had mostly been to Egypt and not enough in Nubia, the majority of the people who dwelled along the Nile he saw must have been ancient Egyptians. And the original term used by both of them is the term Melanes, which means black according to lexicons and to the scholars that translated these books. If Melanes Ness meant tanned, they would have used in their translation the word tanned, but they didn't, and they are the experts, and they know why they specifically used such a term as black. Meaning, a term that means black skin was used on both the ancient Egyptians and the Nubians in the same context, that is, physical description from a direct observer. I did a deep dive on these quotes in a separate video that you can go check on my channel. Metatron also claims that my linguistic approach to the translation is wrong. <laughs> Mate, I would have you know that I am not the one translating the quotes you refuse to show to your audience. I am just quoting from translation works from academics from Europe like you. Western academics. Academics whose translations are linked in the description of my videos, by the way. Take the debate to them. They are the ones who chose the words, they are the ones who translated, they are the ones who did the academic work behind it. I'm quoting them. You make it seem like I am the one who did the translations, but if you cared to look at my description box, you would have noticed the long list of books referenced. The quote from Herodotus I just showed, for example, was translated as black by three different translations. One was actually from a PhD in classics, Andrea L. Purvis, who sadly passed away in 2018. So are you saying she didn't have the expertise and knowledge to choose the term, and so did these other translations? Come on. This is a common argument used to argue against these quotes. They claim that it is Afrocentrists who mistranslate the quotes, like Metatron just tried to do, which is ironical because when you care to look in my reference section, I am very clear about the fact that I am merely quoting from the work of experts in the field. Then Metatron proceeds to present another quote from another author from the 1st to 2nd century AD. So in the same context as the first quote he gave. In this quote, they deal with the Southern Indians who are compared to the Ethiopians and modern Indians who are like the 
ancient Egyptians. One thing that often goes over people's heads in this comparison is the skin tone. Ethiopians of the Nile Valley are like Central Africans to Sudanese Dinka people today. So dark brown skin to jet black. And when one looks at some of the southern Indians even today, you still find the very jet black Indians, who must have been more numerous in the past but reduced in number due to the very present discrimination against dark skinned Indians since the arrival of the Aryan Indo-European people in the Indus Valley. This has been well researched in India now. They know that the Vedic caste system is responsible for discrimination against jet black skinned Indians who became among the untouchables as this study has demonstrated. Most people think that the population of India has always been the way it is now, but studies have clearly demonstrated that this simply hasn't been the case. And further, these quotes also demonstrate that the southern population of India was majoritarily black like most African people. So the point is, since we can agree here that they are speaking of jet black people to dark brown skinned people in the southerly regions of ancient Nile Valley and India, what then is the next tone to that population? It is brown, milk chocolate brown and medium brown as this little chart will help you notice. It is not the light skin or very light skin that Metatron tried to put in your head. It is milk chocolate or brown skin. Then Metatron brings this quote from a philosopher from the 3rd century AD, even later. So mixing has gone on for even longer. Yet this is what Metatron uses to give us a more accurate picture of who the dynastic Egyptians were. And there the author says the following, describing the inhabitants of the frontiers between Nubia and ancient Egypt. The inhabitants of the marshes are not yet fully black, but are half-breeds in matter of color, for they are partly not so black as the Ethiopians, yet partly more so than the Egyptians. Here the author is clearly telling us the Egyptians he saw around the time in the 3rd century AD, 700 years after Herodotus' description by the way, 600 years after the Greek occupation, and 300 years into Roman occupation, the author says they were the least black among the marcher people and the Ethiopians. Not that they were light-skinned like Metatron's skin complexion there. And yet Metatron concluded this. So, according to an ancient Greek, the Egyptians are the light-skinned, the Ethiopians are the black-skinned, and these inhabitants of the marches are in between. Notice, the author said not so black as the Ethiopians, yet partly more so than the Egyptians. More so, letting us know that he still considers the ancient Egyptians as falling under this category of black because their mixed kids are more black than them. Does it make sense to say that a mixed kid between a pale-skinned Arab woman is more black than his mother? It doesn't because the mother is not black. But it would make sense to say so if the mother herself was already mixed or light-skinned black person because there are light-skinned black people, like in the case of Ethiopian women who begot a son to a Sudanese jet black man, the kid will not be as black as his father, but he will be more so than his mother. That is another way to interpret this quote. Now compare this 3rd century AD quote to one that was made 800 years earlier by a Greek poet who had been in the army and lived around the time the ancient Egyptians were not yet conquered. This is the author Aeschylus, a poet who had also moved around the ancient world since he was in the army, so he must have encountered what an Egyptian looked like. And let's see how he describes them in his poem, how he boils them down to. The men on board are plainly seen, their black limbs showing from their white attire. The author is boiling down the Egyptian army as a black army with black limbs. And these wooden statues of armies and Egyptian fleet give us the same description. It's the dark brown skinned people that we today call black as well. Elsewhere, Aeschylus says again, Abominable is the lustful race of Aegyptus. They have sailed here, attended by a mighty black host, and in their wrath overtaken us. A completely different description when we are dealing with Egypt that has not undergone so much occupation and mixing. And in Greek culture, at the time of Herodotus when Egypt was not yet conquered, in Greek culture, they viewed them as black people and their wooden iconography of armies on boats and of these wooden soldiers confirms that. This is another ancient Greek term often found in period sources to describe skin tone and it's one of the favorite of Afrocentric scholars. And it is used to assert the ancient Egyptians' phenotypic type as being black. And for example, they use the words of Herodotus. In reality, anyone who even has the most basic experience in translation of the classics in ancient Greek will tell you that this term is fundamentally polysemic. And it can mean both a black skin or a darker skin as a result of tanning. So when translating Herodotus, how do we know which one it is? This is the term they love to attack because it can have other meanings. I will just let Dr. Rebecca Futo respond to Metatron here. Herodotus describes a group of people called the Colchians as being black. And I would also push, I would push, not, they, he doesn't say that they have dark skin and woolly hair. He has, they have, they say have black skin and kinky hair. Using woolly hair actually is the, pretends that the word that he's using is the same word that's used for sheep and it's not. Sheep's hair is not what they, the word they use to describe people's hair. So 
we want to be careful. It's like tightly twisted, right? Or kinky hair, not woolly hair. And it's not dark skin, it's black. And this is a word that is used of Ethiopians, of Egyptians, of Odysseus and, and others, right? Um, and it, but it codes differently in different contexts. So he's, he, it, the question is, are they of Egyptian stock? It is very likely that there were Egyptians who for whatever reason settled in the Black Sea. The Black Sea has hundreds of colonies that settled all along. The, the city of Miletus itself settled something like 90 colonies and trade outposts on the Black Sea. So, as you heard the doctor in classics here, in the context the word is used, the word should be translated as black because, as Metatron also agrees, context matters. And he recognized in his video that this word can both mean black, as in black people or black skin, and tanned. But in this context, as the doctor just explained, it should be translated as black. In the quote he gave in his video, where they used that word melangroeth, the context is a mythical one. Athena is transforming a man's skin. She's transforming his clothes into something else. And it is describing a Greek. These are the same mythical stories where crazy things happen, like the uncle of Athena being the god of the ocean. These are myths. Whereas Herodotus, who is hailed as the father of history by Europeans, is describing people he saw and thinks they are related to very dark-skinned people in Africa who have kinky hair. The same people he earlier described as black because of the heat, using the term melanes that time, a term used on Ethiopians as well. Hence, they chose black-skinned as the context suggests, as both Dr. Futo, Dr. Andrea L. Purvis, and Sir George Rawlinson agree. Both PhD Andrea Purvis and Sir Rawlinson translated that part as black-skinned. These are not random people. Are you going to call them Afrocentrists too for translating it that way? Again, this is a point I already addressed in the videos you supposedly thoroughly analyzed with your team. You again make it seem like I am the one who did the translation on the passage and that no other scholar would have translated it that way. But again, I use the translations of the above mentioned scholars to reach my conclusion, but you somehow failed to mention it to your audience. Or better yet, address my sources directly. Now, remember that earlier, Metatron said that this aspect of the argument was my weakest point, right? Well, it is when you take it on its own and don't put it in the context, in the larger context of the other evidence we have. But when you put the earliest descriptions I've given you just now, when you pair those with the ancient Greek depictions of the ancient Egyptians, then you realize that the quotes are not to be dismissed. Here is a depiction of the ancient Egyptian king Busiris in ancient Greek art. Notice the features? The short kinky hair, the flat nose, the subnasal prognathism, and these appear on both the king and his soldiers. This is a depiction that dates from the 4th century BC, so in the 400 BC. Here is another one depicting the same scene. This one still depicts the typical subnasal prognathism and flat noses typically seen among black Africans. This is a depiction from 500 BC. So culturally indeed, the ancient Greeks at the time, in the 400s around the time of Herodotus, saw the ancient Egyptians as black. And so the term melancholous that Metatron critiques there should be indeed translated as black, black skinned, as Dr. Rebecca Futo and Andrew L. Purvis and Sir John Rawlinson agree. Here is another depiction that does the same thing? Do you see the way they drew the lips protruding full with a subnasal prognathism on their king? This one also from 480 BC. King Busiris is a mythical figure, and the guy slaying him is Hercules. What is interesting is that to the ancient Greek artists of the 4th century BC, culturally speaking, they consider the ancient Egyptians they knew could be stereotypically represented as black with these features that are typical among black Africans, suggesting that to them the majority of ancient Egyptians were simply black Africans with full lips, kinky hair, and black skin, as Herodotus who visited Egypt around that time confirms in his descriptions, and as Aeschylus as well confirms in his poetic account of the Egyptian army attacking the Greeks. And there's more. This is not the only art. Here is a Greek representation of an Egyptian youth from 200 BC. Short locks, small fat nose, with a subnasal prognathism. A black boy is what they saw, and so they represented it. And there is more, but we can't go over all of them here. So I strongly urge you to watch these two videos from the brilliant channel Mr. Imhotep, who did a deep dive on these descriptions. By the way, Mr. Imhotep also jumped in to make a response to Metatron. Check it out in the description of the video. So you see, Metatron, it is not only the text we take into account. We also take into account iconography and various other factors. Let's carry on. Also, when Diop and many others see and claim that the ancient Egyptian statues have African phenotypes, they start saying things like, uh, well, statues cannot be used to determine race. Yet, Metatron just used the statue to determine the race of Cleopatra, and they do the same with the Greeks. Third deceptive indicator in your discourse, and this one is a full-on straw man fallacy. Namely, you want me to try and defend a point of view that I don't even hold. Nice try. Now, if you did this on purpose, it's a debacle, but once again, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you misunderstood me. 
<laughs> Metatron. Okay, sorry if you felt this argument was aimed at you. It was aimed at the many people who argue against my position and the fact that I use statues among the arguments to defend my position. I was calling out the double standard at play there, that it is perfectly acceptable to use a statue in ancient Greece or Rome to define race via phenotypes, but then turn around and refuse to accept the same method for ancient Egypt. I find that fallacious. For clarification, I didn't say you held that view. I was just calling out the double standard. I have a plethora of problems with your fixation of the word Kemet, which is also a common trait among Afrocentrists. Now, I myself have used the word Kemet on occasion. It's not that the word is wrong, but fixating on it has zero linguistic standing. Ling what? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Nobody said it was for linguistic accuracy that I prefer to use Kemet on my channel. The term Kemet is indeed a conventional agreed upon pronunciation of the ancient Egyptian term Kemet, which they used to refer to the place they lived at. The ancient Egyptian language is a dead language now. All the reconstructions are mere approximations. So I just use the conventional Kemet, and I prefer to call it Kemet as a reference to what is the reality of the history of that region, using a conventional pronunciation that refers to an actual term the ancient people of Kemet used to refer to their land, that is, Kempt, whose hieroglyphics you can see on the screen. Just another point of clarification. And speaking of straw meaning, in the following segment, Metatron said this. Now let's discuss this hieroglyphic inscription that you present as evidence that Kemet or Puma in fact meant land of the black, according to you. Ah, uh, no. I did not present this as an argument for ancient Egypt meaning land of the blacks. But from watching your video, people would never know that. When you watch the entire segment from my original response, I used this term to argue that the ancient Egyptians used this term to refer to themselves as black at least once in a poem. The nuance is very clear there, which I thought was indicative of them seeing themselves as black. But even still, I did not think it was a very strong argument. Plus, you can literally see in his video that I put the meaning of that camp as black people, not the Egyptians. This term is clearly not about the land. And I explained that in the video he is responding to. Notice there is no hieroglyphics referring to the land in that term. But the one with the hieroglyphic of land, I agreed that it does mean black land. In fact, I even said that I believe most likely it refers to the land. It seems Metatron really has preconceived notions about me, since he even called me an Afrocentric, so he has preconceived notions about me, which always brings these kind of issues in a debate. Anyhow, the misunderstanding continues here. We have Kemet followed by a man and a woman sitting with three dots. This is the determinative meaning humanity, but to you it must mean black people. First of all, the adjectival noun in plural form, Kemetu, just means Egyptians. Kemet or Kumat just means black land, not the land of the black, as opposed to the red land of the desert. I already said that I believe Kemet followed by the land determinative or the land hieroglyphics means black land, but then Metatron wants you to believe that I believe it means the land of the blacks. Also, Metatron seems to claim that this reads Kemtu. This does not mean Kemtu. This reads Kemt. Kemtu is written this way, and it means those who inhabit or belong to Kemet, and scholars translate it as the Egyptians, which I think is okay. Now Metatron goes on to say this. The thing is though, that if this means black land, and this is people, why can it not be then black people? Well, this is an answer that you don't need an Egyptologist or a fully qualified linguist, you just need a first year student to answer. Differently from English in Egyptian, the adjective goes after the noun. It is in predicative form, not in attributive form. So in this language, it makes no sense to say first black and then men and women. If they wanted to say black people, they would write it the other way around, people black. And it just so happens that my language, Italian, functions the exact same way. Okay, here again, there is some problem. Notice Metatron agrees with that Kemt followed by the hieroglyphs of land or inhabited place means black land, so adjective followed by noun, but then says that the Kemt followed by the hieroglyphs of people would not mean black people. Why? Because of the reasons he gave. However, when we look at the hieroglyphs of both, we see that they are written in the same format. That is, Kemt, the charcoal sign or crocodile scale, that means black, placed before both hieroglyphics of the nouns. With one, they are okay saying that it means black land, so there the adjective going before the noun is okay. But the other Kemt, black followed by people, you say the adjective can't go before the noun. This is why it is important to show both hieroglyphics as I did in my original response, and break them down for the people. And since you have an Egyptologist in your team, you should be able to. Because without seeing the hieroglyphs, you end up thinking that the Kemt of black land is written with a noun before the glyphs of the adjective. Anyhow, I don't even use this argument in my videos. I only addressed it because you brought it up. This point is not even part of my main argumentation. I'm just addressing this because I noticed these problems in your explanation. Let's move on to the next point, and that is Metatron's claim on the origin of the Afro-Asiatic language family. Deutschland. Also, for reference, linguistically speaking, ancient Egyptian is an Afro-Asiatic language and it does not have, for as much as we understand, Southern African origins. It's Kamito-Semitic. 
Wait, did Metatron just say Hamitosemitic or in his word Kamitosemitic, which is just Hamitosemitic? Did he just say that Hamitosemitic is the origin of the Afro-Asiatic language family? Wow, really? You will soon understand my reaction after you hear this. There is an older name for the Afro-Asiatic family, a horrendously bad name. The alternative name, Hamitosemitic. You recognize the name Ham, of course, here in Hamito. To still use that name today is to perpetuate the horrific invention by racists of a myth, a myth used to justify enslaving Africans. So avoid this name as if it were the plague, or indeed the seven plagues of ancient Egypt. Yeah, as you heard the doctor, this term is very problematic indeed. In his field, this is a term, quote, you should run away from. Because the Hamito part in there refers to the Hamitic race, which was invented by racist people who could not accept that anything great in Africa could have been the creation of black Africans. So they came up with a theory, the Hamitic hypothesis, to explain great fits in Africa such as Great Zimbabwe, Meroe and Kush, Ancient Egypt, Timbuktu, etc. And that is the theory Metatron and his team chose to use to go against the idea that black people could have been the creators of a great African civilization. A racist theory is what you chose to go with Metatron? Out of all the explanations or all the theories for a non-African origin of the Afro-Asiatic language family, you pick the racist one? Really? You will say you didn't know? Isn't this your field, Metatron? This is linguistics, right? Your domain. Are you not aware of Professor Greenberg's position on this? Wildly supported by any serious linguist, by the way. And Greenberg, by the way, is a very famous linguist in the field of linguistics. Greenberg said, in view of the outdated racial and ethnic connotations of the term Hamitic and the fact that it does not refer to any valid linguistic entity, I suggest the name Afro-Asiatic for this family as the only one found both in Africa and in Asia. Here Greenberg just explained why he chose Afro-Asiatic instead of Hamitosemitic as the name for the language family he identified in Africa. This is a prominent scholar from your field. How did you let this Hamitosemitic theory to the origin of the Afro-Asiatic language family in your video? This is a huge red flag. Because I know the kind of people in my comment section who love to bring up this racist theory. It is the kind of people that think that black Africans are too simple-minded or unsophisticated for complex civilization. Is that like a wink to such people? Sort of a dog whistle? We don't know. Why would you bring this up? That gives racism vibes, Metatron, to all this reluctance from you to admit a black African origin to this language family. And further to ancient Egypt, in spite of the evidence presented to support it. Stop it, Metatron. Racist theories? Really? Come on. You are an influential figure. And when you cite obsolete racist theories like this, you are only emboldening racist guys in this debate. This theory went over most of your audience's scrutiny, but not me, because I know this term. None of the scholars in your team found this term and hypothesis problematic. Three linguists and an Egyptologist, and none of them found this problematic. Wow. It is frankly quite disappointing, I have to say. Let's now focus on the claim that the Afro-Asiatic language family does not have origins in the southern parts of Africa. On this part, Metatron again seems to be unaware or fails to let the audience know that most linguists today in the field now subscribe to an African origin to the Afro-Asiatic language family. It is not a clear-cut thing as he said that it is Hamitosemitic, no. Most linguists today subscribe to an African origin and many who still doubt still think the origin of the family will be found within the African continent. And by the way, Afro-Asiatic refers to the fact that the languages of that family are present in both Asia and Africa, not that the origin is shared by both. As the evidence has shown, the only branch outside of Africa is Semitic. Most of the languages of that family are spoken within the African continent. Hence, most of the scholars propose an African origin due to the increasing amount of evidence that points to that direction. Many experts in the field share the opinion of Christopher Eret on the origin of this family. And where does Eret believe it originated? Please listen to the expert himself. If there is a region where the earliest branching of a language family, where the earliest branchings of that family cluster close to each other, that will be most likely the region where the languages of the family have longest been spoken. So how do these principles apply to ancient Egyptian? Well, the geography of the successive branchings of the Afroasiatic tree puts it beyond doubt in my mind, beyond reasonable doubt is the term I would use, uh, that one, that the family originated somewhere in the Horn of Africa in and around that region, and Two, that speakers of the languages of the family then spread in a step-by-step -step succession of advances outward from the horn. 
Yeah. As you heard the expert again, the family has origins in Africa. Not specifically further south, but as you heard Dr. Eric say, in and around the Horn of Africa. So it could have been in Eritrea there, or in northern Sudan, or in southern Egypt, or down south in the Horn. And a lot of the archaeological data we have points to deep within the Horn of Africa, further south. And even the Semitic branch is believed to have also come from Africa for pretty much the same reasons that Dr. Eric gave, as these scholars John Hunegard and Naama Patel inform us here. Given the fact that all other branches of Afro-Asiatic are African, and given the comparative uniformity of Semitic vis-a-vis -vis those other branches, it is likely that early speakers of Semitic entered Southwest Asia from Africa. This quote is from the book The Semitic Languages 2019, pretty recent, page 20. I agree with Dr. Eretz there, because I also think the evidence for an African origin is well supported, with archaeological documents and field studies, and the fact that most of the languages of that family are widespread in Africa, which is a telltale sign in linguistics for the origin of the language family. All the branches of that family are within the African continent, except for Semitic. All this and all the other reasons Eret mentioned in his lecture. By the way, check out Dr. Eret's lecture on the Africanity of Ancient Egypt, where he relays information on what we currently know about the archaeological data we found on the origin of the Afro-Asiatic language family. I guess Dr. Eret would also be classified as an Afrocentric scholar in Metatron's book. Why? Because he disagrees with him. Because his position and mine would give an African origin to the ancient Egyptian language and, by extension, to its writing system and its people. We can both agree with the fact that when we look at artistic representation, men tend to have in general a darker skin tone and women tend to have a lighter skin tone. Now, of course, there are the occasional men that have more of a yellow skin tone, but in the majority of cases, we could say that those are eunuchs. So let's talk about this difference between men and women when it comes to skin tone in Egyptian art. My interpretation is the fact that it's possible that in general, the population had a bit of a lighter skin tone. They weren't white, but they had a lighter skin tone. And then this skin tone becomes darker because men tend to work the fields, whereas women don't. To you, specifically, this is a fantasy. The intellectually honest answer to this is that more evidence is required to be deemed conclusive. These are theories. Since you are the one who said that it's important to evaluate and present both sides of the argument, well, you didn't. Okay, this segment proves to me that he never actually watched all my videos thoroughly. I believe it was just a boast at this point. Because in my video on the origin of the debate, I presented scholars who adhered to this idea and I said it was a fantasy because they don't have an actual proof that there ever was such a convention. It is just their interpretation of the paintings they see in the tombs. That is, men brown, women yellow. In actuality, the more you look at the term paintings, the more you realize that the convention hypothesis does not stand. Metatron claims that we need more paintings to reach a much better conclusion. We have the paintings. How many tombs have been excavated in Egypt today? You say that because the more we dig, the less your interpretation seems likely. The following set of images disproves the idea of a convention and supports the idea of a variation of skin tones as I previously pointed out in the representation. Check out these few images. Look at this queen that Metatron skipped on purpose. This is a queen that has deep brown skin. Her skin is even a bit darker than that of her husband, but then when you look at the arm of her husband, you can see that it's the same skin tone. Again, was she toiling the fields with the workers? Clearly, we have a queen with deep brown skin, dark brown skin here that you skipped with your Photoshop color picker. And this image was altered in certain books by Europeans. I believe it was a French book about ancient Egypt, and they made these people white, not like the painting, because they knew what the painting would entail. It would break their thing about yellow women and brown men. Next image is Queen Hatshepsut. Queen Hatshepsut is here depicted with brown skin, again, and her features, when you compare them to that of a West African woman, like this journalist here, look at the similarities in skin tone, in the nose shape, and the lips, both full. Another queen that was toiling the field. And now, for the queen that was the blackest of them all, Queen Amosene Fertari, with her jet black skin, her nest son, with brown skin. This suggests variation of skin tone, as Metatron fails to acknowledge. It's variation of skin tone, not a convention. A jet black woman and her brown son. Just as you can see on this picture of this actor and this model. This is clearly how you would depict these two other paintings such as that of ancient Egypt. And then we have here again a brown skinned woman from the tomb of Mena. And then you compare this woman to Ethiopian ladies today and the tone is very much among the black African tone. Next is the image from the Middle Kingdom so that he does not say that I'm taking images from a specific era. These are different people from different eras. The first image of the queen and her king was the picture of Seti I and his queen. Now this one is Queen Ashayet and her attendant. 
servants. See the variation of skin tone? Not a convention. How is the queen darker than her servants? It does not make any sense. And then you have two jetpack ladies with short kinky hair. The queen is dark brown and the servants here are pale skinned. They are yellow skinned. I never said that this type could never be in ancient Egypt. They were there, present, even from the beginning, but they were just not the majority. And then you have these other ladies in attendance. Medium brown skin, brown skin and dark brown skin for the queen herself. This is a facile painting. What? This is a facile painting. Facsimile. 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 Okay. Facsimile. Painting on the sarcophagus of Queen Hashayet. This is Mentuhotep's the second wife. Again, another image showing the same skin tone of men and women, brown skin. And then we have this other image, the lords and their ladies coming to give gifts to this lord and his lady, both of them having the same skin tone. All this suggests what? Variation of skin tone is what you see when the tones vary. See again here, this I believe a wedding party. Both men and women are having brown skin. And when you look closer, I don't know if you can see this, their features suggest flat noses, subnasal prognathism and full lips. These are images he skipped in his video, especially this one of the wedding. I put it in the first video, but he didn't use it. Another image here, men and women having the same tone. Another one, men and women having the same similar tone. Here, the women are lighter. To prove to you that many of the paintings just represent a variation of skin tone, here is another image of jet black Egyptians with light brown Egyptians. They will say the jet black ones are just Nubians living in Egypt, as always. And then this other image, this is from the tomb of Oremep, I believe. And the men and the women, both the servants, are depicted with this brown skin. Not the women represented with yellow and not the men represented with brown, both of them with brown skin. Again, Metatron, a convention, your interpretation, which tomb paintings did you look at? We have enough of them, and the more you look at them, the less they suggest a convention. I to show you the coloration of Egyptian wall paintings and the actual coloration of olive skin that the Metatron is talking about. And then you show this to prove that they don't match. This is another aspect of the conversation that led me to my accusation of lack of rigor in the research of the Metatron. The tomb paintings I have shown you are freely available online and appear on many searches. But what do you see in the Metatron's video? A few images that support his own interpretation. And Metatron, since you claim to have watched all my videos, you should be aware that we do have more evidence and data on this topic. My friend the debunker provides me with pictures of entire tombs. And when I look at them, I don't see a convention. And as you have just seen, many women had brown skin, some even deep brown skin. They even had a queen with jet black skin and her mommy has typical African braids. And we also saw another queen with deep dark brown skin. How many more tombs do we need to dig up before you accept that your theory, your interpretation does not stand? A thousand more? Ten thousand more? Clearly the evidence suggests that there is no convention but actual representation of skin tone differences and variation, which is my position. Since as we both agree, many ethnicities were present and were part of the society. It's just that the olive skin you think was the majority was not the majority back then from the evidence gathered so far but then you claim this about me also i find it interesting that you say that we people that don't agree with afrocentric ideas are blind because i mean you're trying so hard to prove that the word olive skin does not represent and does not work and does not match the color that we see in iconography the brown women in paintings and the variation of skin tone can be observed on the paintings. But when you refuse to acknowledge them and keep showing no threat and her prints, I sometimes have to wonder whether you can see. <laughs> Sorry if you felt offended, but I have an entire video about brown skin women in ancient Egypt and skin tone variation on paintings in ancient Egypt. This video and you skipped it. These are the things you don't need a degree to see. One just needs proper eyesight and look at the real paintings from the tombs. Did you even watch it, Metatron? Did you watch the video thoroughly as you claimed? Even the video you are responding to has pictures of brown women that you chose to skip, as I've just proven earlier with the picture of the queen and her king. Then you bring up this argument of the Photoshop color picker. But I mean, I went over it with the Photoshop color picker. They are the exact same. Are you blind? Do you understand you just proved my point? Olive skin will match with some people and it will not match with others because some have an olive skin, some have a brown skin. That just proves that they are multi-ethnic. So now Metatron agrees with the variation of skin tone argument. Does he not believe in a conventional representation? That is, women yellow, men brown, and yellow men, units. LOL, he destroyed his own conventional argument. Also, let's look at this guy's skin, which you used on your video to demonstrate that the current Egyptians have no relation whatsoever with ancient Egyptians. Let's compare his color on the Photoshop color picker with the color used in Egyptian paintings. Metatron. I never used those pictures to claim that modern Egyptians were not related to the ancient Egyptians. I never even used the farmer's picture to claim that his skin tone was not part of the ancient Egyptian civilization. It could very well be that his skin tone was very present in the Delta. I never claimed that his type was not there. I am saying that there would have been the minority. My position on this was made clear in one of those videos. I very much think today that modern Egyptians are related to the ancients, but that the majority of the population has had too much foreign influence, but still they are African. 
Africans despite foreign influences, which DNA evidence also suggests. Anyhow, on the image comparison you did, here is why I said you cherry picked. See folks, here is the full image. Notice anything? This is a painting from the tomb of Nebaman, and his woman is darker than him. Even his little girl is darker than him. Why not choose to compare these women to the olive skinned model as well, or even to the current Egyptian man is comparing? Although I never said that his skin tone could never be found in ancient Egypt, I just said that it was not the more common tone. Why not use the other images I used in the video to compare the skin to the modern man and see if they all match? This image proves the cherry picking tactic and debunks the idea of a convention in coloring in ancient Egyptian paintings. Since your position is that women who didn't work the fields were represented as lighter, how are these two even darker than the men in the family? Clearly the painters represented a variation in skin tone. Only black people in this world can live there and work outside without protecting their skin because they have high melanin content that is already protecting their skin from the UV rays. There is no way a Eurasian people can live in Egypt and walk around bare chest and be fine with it. No, no. Look, an Asiatic person with no shirt on under the sun. Also, do you realize you're talking to a Sicilian? Our farmers are Europeans and work the fields often without shirts on. This is ridiculous that only black people can survive this. And again, Sicily and Egypt have almost the same temperature. Egypt is a little hotter, I'll give you that, although it really depends on the day. Absolutely ridiculous statement. So, Metatron, are you saying the environment does not affect our bodies? A population with the skin tone of Arabs, for example, would prefer to cover their bodies to avoid the constant pressure of the burning sun rays of Egypt, much like modern Egyptian farmers do today. It is the smart human thing to do, because their skin is likely to suffer serious damage if they don't protect it from the UV rays, because they don't have enough melanin in their skin as a natural protector. Also, Egypt and Sicily have the same weather, maybe the Delta region, but the entirety of the region? Come on. Also here, Metatron seems to be implying that the ancient Egyptians would have been like modern Mediterranean people like him. And so, they would be fine with such a climate working bare-chested outside just as they do in Sicily. It is fun to work outside in summer without a shirt, but doing it all year round and all day in a hot, dry climate is not advisable for pale skin like Metatron's skin because of skin cancer. Also, what Metatron does not know is that they have tested mommy's skin in ancient Egypt and they had high melanin content too high to classify them as Caucasian. Dr. Shekhan Tadia had carried this study, but they didn't accept the facts. The reason? Oh, but mommy's skin is too damaged to isolate anything. But later studies have proven this wrong. How? Enter the study by Anna Maria Makota, 2005, where she not only demonstrated that the skin tissues of the mummies were well preserved, but she was also able to get the melanin content of their skin. Take a listen to what the study had to say about it in an extract of the video from the brilliant channel The King's Monologue. During an excavation headed by the German Institute for Archaeology in Cairo in the year 2000, researchers sought to carry out anthropological and paleopathological analysis of the human remains from three tombs of the nobles of the necropolis of Thebes West. An additional study was conducted by Makota and Vermeeren, published in 2005. The study sought to test the quality of methods of rehydration for mummified tissue. In the study, samples were taken from a pool of 273 mummies dated from the New Kingdom, Samples were taken from each organ of each of the mummies. During analysis of the skin samples, biologists noted that skin sections showed particularly good tissue preservation. Although much of the epidermis had already separated from the dermis, the remaining epidermis often was preserved well. The basal epithelial cells were packed with melanin as expected for specimens of negroid origin. In essence, the epidermis was consistent with black or negroid African groups based on the density of the melanin. This was the only conclusive assumption made alluding to ethnicity during the study since its purpose was to compare methods of rehydration. This objective conclusion gives a silent nod to the tireless efforts of Diop and his protégés, who always knew that given the opportunity to test, the ancient Egyptians would be proven to be amongst the same ethnic stock as their African brethren. The samples used were from noble tombs, and they were packed with melanin because of their negroid, that is, black African origins. So, the idea of a majority tanned population is very much unlikely, since their nobles had skin that was packed with melanin. Their population lived in Africa, originated in Africa, and so did their language, with their tomb paintings constantly depicting brown skin to dark brown skin, and people who saw them describing them as black people in Africa. The idea of a majority black African population is very much what the evidence points to. That clearly depict African phenotypes. You also seem to operate under the assumption that the word African just equals black. That's incorrect. See, 
We're resorting to putting words in my mouth now. I never claimed that African equals black. I said they are typical African phenotypes. And contrary to what you seem to think, I am well aware that we Africans present a greater phenotypic diversity. Even within the black Africans themselves, there is phenotypic diversity. Something the King's monologue and I called you out on, and then you proceeded to call it a cheap shot. But one thing you have to answer, Metatron, is why the ancient Egyptians used these specific phenotypes for the word for face in their language. Please let us know why they boiled down the typical face of their population to these features. Do you recognize these features? These are the typical black African features. Flat, broad nose, full lips, and all. Just as much as these images from ancient Greece boiled down the face of the ancient Egyptian too. Why do their kings look like this? Please let us know to what population these faces resemble the most. You say I deceive people when it comes to the looks of the Nubians, but by the looks of it, I'd say that you are the one who is deceiving people when it comes to what Nubians look like, since you systematically selected and showed only images when you see both Egyptians and Nubians mixing together. You specifically chose to give more importance to a picture that shows Egyptians and Nubians together, deciding to read it as they are all Egyptians, instead of the more probable that's a native Egyptian and that's a Nubian who lives in Egypt. And since some of these images come from tomb TT40, which belonged specifically to one of the governors of Nubia, it should not be surprising that we are looking at a more integrated, multi-ethnic section of the Egyptian territory. See, I played his whole segment there, because I again believe in fair representation of the opposing argument. Now, did I get the same treatment in his segment? Did he even show the images I brought up? No, he did not, because they are not easy to attack when you see them. I said he deceived people about the looks of the Nubians, which he did. And I said that because he only showed one picture of the Nubians by the ancient Egyptians, this image, there is the lack of rigor again, because there are many more other images of the Nubians in ancient Egypt, freely available online that I have shown on my channel in many videos. But what does he choose to show? This image from King Tut's chest. But where are the images I showed in the video he's responding to, or on the channel he supposedly thoroughly analyzed? where he claims that I am systematically choosing images where Nubians and Egyptians are mixing, and that I decided to read it as they are all Egyptians. Boy, I don't even know what he's referring to here, since he does not show any imagery. He's only reading on his phone. Where is the rigor? This is a guy that has a full team behind him. They could have put the images on the screen. But let's just go over a few images so that you can see that the Nubians were indeed represented similarly in skin complexion to the ancient Egyptians, except of course for the jet black Nubians. So here are some images of the Nubians. Notice the coloration skin the artist chose to use, brown and jet black, clearly showing a variation of skin tone among the Nubians, which is something you can see in Africa as shown on this picture of these two women. So brown skin, and then you have here images of the Nubians again, dressed almost like Egyptians, but then here you have two Egyptian men accompanying the Nubians to see their king. Compare the skin tone to that of the brown Nubians, there is no difference whatsoever. And this is an image from the temple at Beit El Ali. Now here is the images of TT40 that he was talking about. See the variation of skin tone? And then he would say that these are integrated Nubians, and they just so happen to have the skin tone of the ancient Egyptians. The delta of Egypt was also connected to Asia. Why are these Asian men not represented anything closer to the ancient Egyptian skin tone compared to the Nubians when they are being trampled? Many of them share the skin tone of the pharaoh, but with the Asians, none of them share the skin tone of the pharaoh, even though many Asians came to mix in with the ancient Egyptians. So again, these are olive-skinned people that Metatron is talking about. Again, another set of Africans. This is now from the tomb of Rekmeyer or Rekmire. Here depicted are Africans bringing tribute to Egypt again. These images are dismissed by Metatron because they clearly debunk the idea of a tanned olive skin because we saw olive skinned people from Asia being trampled and these are soldiers they should be tanned and none of them even remotely has a brown skin. They were boiled down to yellow skin because that's what the ancient Egyptians saw. Or maybe these were soldiers who were always inside like the women of ancient Egypt. And even if, as you say, it should be interpreted as a Nubian living in ancient Egypt, why do they have the same brown skin color on some paintings? When the ancient Egyptians represented a typical Asiatic, the color is often very light or yellow, nothing like the brown they use on half of the Nubians and themselves. This fact is inconsistent with the idea that most ancient Egyptians were tanned olive skinned like most Western Asians or Middle Easterners today, since when they saw people who looked olive skinned, they showed it in their paintings. Also, the ancient people in that region that are closest to the ancient Egyptians culturally, linguistically, religiously, anthropometrically, and historically are the Nubians. And this we have even from ancient accounts like Diodorus Siculus and Herodotus. These were essentially the same people. And we are finally at the end of the video, where he says that Dr. Tiop and Dr. Obenga did not win the UNESCO debate. Typical. Zayawa said the same thing that Metatron is saying. But the reality is that given what the scholars believed at the time, they won. But I guess since Metatron is gonna make a video on that, I will have to wait for his arguments and then make my response. But there's one more thing. 
Metatron, I hope you do better than this. Should you choose to speak on this issue again? If not, please leave this issue alone. Please leave the subject alone. If you aren't willing to do the necessary research for it, I would actually prefer that you leave it alone. So that's what you tell everyone who disagrees with you? Do not talk. I thought you guys were into debates. If you are so sure of your research and Afrocentric resources, why shy away from debates and asking your opponent to not speak at all? Afrocentric sources. Really? A further attempt to discredit the research I have done on the channel. Metatron just called all the sources I have presented here and before on my channel Afrocentric, which is basically discrediting it as not scientific valuable. And why do this? Because they don't go along with his interpretation. Also, you are again misunderstanding what I said. I specifically told you to do better because you are a scholar and you know where to get scholarly resources. I did not ask you to stay silent about this issue. I am not your dad to tell you what to do. You do what you want. If you want to spread poorly researched videos, go ahead. But I had to let you know that if you choose to come into this conversation, you better have the time and scholarly resources. And was I not right? Did you not gather a team of scholars for this subject this time around? Just accept that you took the advice I gave you and gave more time and resources to the topic. And I am all for a debate, but please let's present each other's arguments properly and honestly. And when we present sources, please let's stay away from ad hominem attacks. Serious scholars worked on those studies, Metatron, books and articles, and field research for years. It is quite unjust to dismiss them as Afrocentric without even looking into them. And at the end of this video, you've been with me, people. What are the good points I made? Metatron never mentioned them. Not once in his entire video. Oh, we agreed that ancient Egypt is in Africa. So that's one of the good points I made, I guess. So yeah, Metatron, next time please feel free to address my sources because I believe in listing them in my video's description. Something you expressly did not let your audience know about my channel. Oh, I forgot. All my sources are Afrocentric, emotionally driven and political nonsense. Dr. Arad would be glad to know that his research is political nonsense. Thanks to Metatron. And also, let's stay away from inferring what is in the mind of our debate opponent. You say I have deep-seated feelings to prove this while failing to address my sources. But the fact is, you don't know me personally, Metatron, and you don't know what is in my mind. Are you a mind reader or something? Since you can see Africans from Sicily, maybe you can read my mind from there. Cheap shot, I know. Just kidding, I like to tease people. I could also say that you have an implicit anti-black sentiment that you wouldn't admit and that's why you make videos like these appearing on your screen. And why you bring up a racist obsolete hypothesis, it's all because of the deep-seated anti-black sentiment. But I don't do this, because this doesn't concern whether an argument is valid or not. And further, it would simply be mere speculation because I can't know for sure. I don't know you personally. I only see you through your YouTube videos. So why bring them up instead of addressing the arguments? Because they make the opponent look bad and a dominant attack. It's directed at the person rather than their argument. This is it for my response to Metatron's response. As you have seen, few of the arguments I actually brought up on my channel were addressed, let alone the sources, and few of the good points he claimed I brought up on my original response were even brought up, and my channel is full of more data linked in the description to support my claims. Anyhow, I'm just glad the debate has been opened. I'm just disappointed at all the attempts at making me look bad. For a team of scholars, it is sad you felt the need to come into the debate with these kind of tactics. You could have easily focused on the arguments with your team, since you guys are all PhD these scholars, but you felt the need to make me look bad first. Disappointing. As to all the viewers, thank you kindly for watching. I really appreciate you being here. These subjects are important and I appreciate the attention you give to them. Special thanks to the brilliant channel Mr. Imotep for his brilliant response to Metatron. An attack on you is an attack on me as well, brother. Special thanks as well to the brilliant YouTube channel The King's Monologue for his help in making this video. Many thanks to the YouTube channel Grassy C. Shout out to Grassy C for his great response to Metatron as well. You made some good points, brother. Go check out Grassy C's response to Metatron. Also linked in the description. Really guys, I am so grateful to all of you. You along with my subscribers have made me feel that the hours I spent on the research I do have meaning and great value. Thank you. And for those who aren't subscribed, consider subscribing. More videos are coming. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.